went to cities. He went to Athens, big, well-known city, popular city. Many people went to Athens to learn. People are still going to Athens. People from all over the United States still go to Athens to see the Parthenon, the Acropolis, Mars Hill. They still go there. It's a great, great city. From Athens, he went to Corinth. There is a peninsula. And he went down 50 miles from Athens to Corinth. And he's alone. All the time he was in Athens, he's alone. He sent for Silas and Timothy and told them to come quickly. He needed them, but they never came. They never came to Athens. And he went down the peninsula alone, and he went to Corinth alone. But eventually, Silas and Timothy caught up with him in Corinth, but he started out there alone. He went to big cities, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus. Ephesus, 250,000 people. And Athens, not so many people, but great in popularity and achievement. And he went Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, three cities. Almost the same thing happened in all three cities. He went in, he went to the synagogue and taught the Jews. For a while, they listened to him teach. Then when he got into Christ and the Messiah, and all of that, then trouble broke out with the Jews, and he had to leave the synagogue. He went to some other place. In Athens, he went to the market. After the Jews are through with him, he went to the marketplace. In Corinth, where the Jews said he fell out after he went to the synagogue and taught them, he went to a man's house. And the church started meeting there, or new converts started meeting there. Then he went to Ephesus, and he went to the synagogue, taught them, fell out, trouble, going to get him. So he moves over to the, uh, the hall of Tyronius. Everywhere, it started the same pattern. Go to the synagogue, teach them two, three sessions, trouble, trouble, then he moves to another location, Athens, the marketplace, Corinth, he went to a house, and in Ephesus, he went to a public building and taught in the afternoon. The people in those cities had a siesta that from after dinner, they rested and slept till late afternoon. That was a siesta time. Everybody rested. Paul rented that hall in Ephesus and every day taught the Word of God there. He may have taught in Ephesus the book of Romans, which he wrote, but uh, he went to another place. Then there's people come everywhere except Athens. People came and a lot of people got saved. That may have happened in Athens after he left, but it didn't happen while he was there. He had the same thing in Corinth. Go to the synagogue, teach, trouble, move to another location, then many people get saved. And a church is formed and born. Then they either come after him or, for some reason, he leaves to go to another town. He went to Athens, 
Corinth, Ephesus. Eventually, at the end of his life, he went to the most powerful city in the world. He went to Rome, and he went to Jerusalem. He always going to the city. You could reach people in the city, and then they could go out and reach little towns and that. And a city, you got problems. There's always problems in cities. There's trouble of housing, uh, poor people, a slum area. Every city's got trouble. It's hard to start a church in a big, big city. You can do better out in the country or with a little town, but you don't reach as many people. Paul, the first verse in Acts 18, after these things, after Athens and walking down the peninsula, uh, 50 miles he walked by himself. He came to, from Athens, he came to Corinth. Corinth is a, is a city of wealth, because it was on a peninsula and seaport came in this way, a seaport came in this way. There was three miles between the sea and the sea. There were three miles. And if they brought produce in on this side, they'd have to put it in a wagon or cart and haul it over to the other side for it to go the other direction. And eventually, they cut a channel through there so that boats could go from this side of the sea to the other side. So right in the middle was Corinth. You got all of this commerce coming in this way, coming in this way from the sea, coming up from the south on the peninsula, and coming down from Athens' direction. Everything was coming into Corinth from north, south, east, west, and it was a city of wealth. Also, being just 50 miles from Athens and all of their philosophers and everything, uh, it had overflown into Athens until there was intellectualism and philosophers in Athens as there were in, uh, in Corinth as there were in Athens. So Paul is going to a wealthy city and he's going to a city of wisdom. But more than anything, he's going to a city of wickedness. It was known in the world for being the most wicked city until if a man was really evil, they would call him a Corinthian, whether he lived in Corinth or not. If he was a bad, bad man, people would label him a Cor Corinthian because that town had such a bad reputation. I don't want to get into the dirt, but up on the hill above Athens commercial center and market, up on the hill there was a temple, and, uh, and there was a temple, uh, a goddess in that temple, uh, the god of Athenia had come down. She had 2,000, it was a, it was an idolatrous that had to do with physical sex, and they had 2,000 prostitutes, women, priestesses, working at that temple. Evil men and the men of Corinth would go up, not necessarily to worship, but to have uh, pleasure with those priestesses. They would serve all day. At night, the priestesses, the 2,000, women came down into the city of Corinth and walked the streets as prostitutes. Now that's a wicked city. I think the most wicked place I think I've ever been is Thailand, where according to Gut Lai and others, one half of the women in Thailand, Bangkok, are prostitutes. Half of the women are prostitutes. If you want a divorce in Thailand, you go down to the government and sign your name. You're divorced. 
if you want a divorce in Marietta, the woman can contest it, the man can contest it, you end up in court down there, and they have a trial on whether you can have a divorce or not. And it's up to the judge whether to grant it. You have to go through a legal system to get a divorce. In Thailand, sign your name. You don't owe your wife anything. You don't leave your house to her. She has no right to anything that you have. You sign your name, you're divorced. That's it. It's all over. The same with a woman. She can go down and sign up, and she's divorced from her husband. That's Thailand. I, I was there in the most wicked city known in the world at that time was Corinth with all of its immorality, all of its wisdom, and all of its wealth, and all of its wickedness, was all in Corinth. And in our study in the book of Acts, Paul's there. He's right there in the middle of it. And he later said he went there in fear and trembling. He walked down that peninsula and entered Corinth and later said, he went there in fear and trembling. What was he afraid of? Well, there's the philosophers just the same as the ones up at Athens. He's going to have to face them. He's going to have to face the commerce and all of this activity coming in from the north and south and east and west. He's going to have to face all that commercial activity and he's going to have to face that wickedness, that immoral city with 2,000 prostitutes walking the street every night and the next day serving it at the temple on the hill. Fear and trembling. He came to Corinth. But there... Nobody with him. He found a Jew. His name was, say it. Say it. Put up the verse 2. He found certain Jew named, say it. All the Americans with our hillbilly accents and other things. Aquila, but that's not it. We say it. We say so many words in, from the Bible that's not right, but we've done it so long you can't change it. It's not Mount Carmel. Carmel. It's, it's Mount Carmel. It's not Mount Hermon. It's Mount Hermon. It's not Aquila. Aquila. It's Aquila. Aquila, that is the proper pronunciation of that name, Aquila. Now, you boys go out to preach in a country church, you say Aquila, they'll think you're smart. <laughs> Aquila, born in Pontus, that's up by the Black Sea in the area of Romania today. She was from there, Aquila. Uh, uh, he, uh, Aquila later come from Italy, and his wife, we say Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla, every American preacher, Paul met Aquila and Priscilla, it was Aquila and Prisca. Aquila and Persisca. Persisca, that was the woman's name but we are hillbillies and say, Priscilla, it's Priscilla, because that Claudius, they have come down from Italy, they're Jews, but they got thrown out of Rome because Claudius, Rome would just for a while treat Jews right, and then for a while not treat them right, and they threw all the Jews out of Rome, and Aquila and Prisca got thrown out. Be careful. It's not Christian persecution. 
because there is no proof in the Bible that Aquila and Prisca were Christians when they got thrown out of Rome. And they had to depart from Rome, so they went to Corinth to live, because they, they can't live in Rome, but go somewhere. And they have a profession. They have work that came unto them next, because he was of the same craft, Aquila and Prisca, Aquila and Priscilla, were tent makers. They made tents. People bought tents. A lot of people lived in tents. If you traveled, there wasn't a motel. You took a tent with you. Tents were prevalent in that day, and they were tent makers. That was their craft. And he met that couple, and he lived with them. He abode with them. That means he probably led them to Christ when he was living with them because they both became Christians and both became tremendous workers for God until Paul remembers them in the last chapter of Acts as his co-workers. They helped him, Aquila and Priscilla. He abode with them and wrought worked. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And Paul, in Tarsus, had learned to make tents. It was a tent-making city. Tarsus, the city he came from as a boy, he, he learned to make tents there. And he, he joined up with these tent makers. And there was a business in Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla and Paul, tent makers. And he's living with them and working with them and no doubt leads them to Christ because they become Christians and no doubt living with them, he led them to Christ. Next, he reasoned in the synagogue. There it is. He went to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue in, in Antioch of Presidia. He went to the synagogue in Iconium. He didn't go to the synagogue in Lystria because they didn't have one. He didn't go to the synagogue in Derby because they didn't have one. He had to have ten men. And, uh, but he went to the synagogue every Sabbath, the day they met, and persuaded the Jews. He argued with them. He talked with them. He taught them. He showed them the Old Testament. Most of all, he was showing them Christ that Christ was the Messiah. That was his message. After dealing with those philosophers in Athens, he went down to Corinth. He said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm not going to talk to you about Stoic philosophy. I'm not going to talk to you about Epicurean philosophy. I, I had enough of that in Athens. When he got to Corinth, he said, I am determined. I've decided, and I'm determined. I'm not going to preach a thing to you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Then later, in the book of Corinthians, he indicates what his first message was when he came to them, that Jesus Christ died for sinners according to the scriptures, dead, buried, and rose again, according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Old Testament, no New Testament book had been written, according to the scriptures. Why? What's he saying? When I went to the synagogue, I taught the scriptures. I taught that Jesus Christ died for our sin, according to the Old Testament Jewish scriptures. I taught that he arose again from the Old Testament scriptures. It's the first thing he taught, because he was determined to talk, preach nothing to them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So in the synagogue on the Sabbath, we know what he taught. 
because he told us that his first message to them when he came to Corinth was that Jesus died for sinners according to the scriptures. He was dealing with Jews and he rose again according to the scriptures. And he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, the Gentiles, about Christ. Next. When Silas and Tim Timotheus came, see, they never caught up with him in Athens, although Paul sent for him. With the men that took him down to Athens, he sent them back telling them with a message, get Silas and Timothy down here. They never came. And he was there alone, and he traveled to Corinth alone. And then into town comes Silas and Timotheus, who were come from Macedonia. Paul was pressed in the spirit. This is so uh, where it, it meets, the rubber meets the road for missionaries. Paul here in the mission, for a missionary study and there's no better book to study missions than Acts. You see the master and what he did in missionary work. But here's a problem with missionaries. He's pressed in spirit. He was depressed. He was discouraged. He is down spiritually. He is down emotionally. Paul, the great preacher, 13 books of the Bible, maybe 14. Started 100 churches, three journeys, three missionary trips. Is depressed and discouraged and thinking about quitting. There is a problem you face in missionary work. You get discouraged and say, I'm going to quit quit. They had a great preacher up at Wheaton College. He had been a missionary and now he was president of Wheaton when Wheaton was a good Christian school. He used to tell the students, it's always too soon to quit. Think of that. It's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. If you think about quitting, it's too soon to quit. Well, I'm, I don't like college. I don't like Bible college. I'm going to quit. It's too soon to quit. Finish the semester. Things may change. Take the next semester. Well, I'm, I'm in the second semester and I'm going to quit. It's too soon to quit. Finish the semester. Well, it's summer, and there's not much going on, and there's not very many hanging around here, and I'm thinking about quitting. It's too soon to quit. Wait for school to start in the fall. Well, you start in the fall, and everything's changed, and you've got new students and new teachers and new subjects, and I, I'm going to quit. No, it's too soon to quit. Finish the semester. See? If you believe that, you'll always keep going. Good. You think I never thought about quitting? Good, I'm going I'm to quit the, the first week. I quit. I went to Bob Jones University and they said, sign up day. You're going to sign up. There are 3,500 3, students there, 3,000, and I came out of there. I went to school with 24. And I'm in a school with 3,500 students, 3,500. By the time I quit, there were 5,000 by the time I graduated. But I went down there, and I went up there in the country to school, and we didn't read. I never read a book. I never studied. I played basketball. If you played basketball, you made it through. And and I played basketball, I was always on my mind was basketball. I practiced all summer. Uh, I put up an old hoop out there at home and got a basketball, and I practiced all summer shooting, shooting. 
I averaged 23 points a game my junior year. I averaged 24 points a game my senior year. I was elected all county in Noble County and over here at the sectional tournament where there's many schools, I was elected to the first five uh, in that secular, uh, in that sectional tournament over there. I got trophies for being the best foul shooter and I was elected captain of my team every year that I played. I knew something about basketball, that's all I did. I, I never read a book, I just played basketball. You know. And that's all that was on my mind. Paul, he's depressed in spirit, he's gonna quit. I went to Bob Jones University after playing basketball for four years in high school. And they said, sign up, what's that big book? That big book is History of Civilization, you need it. You take it, you buy it, you take it. What's that book? You gotta take biological science there's the book, buy it, you've got to take biological science. And, and there is speech, you've got to buy that book, and you've got to do this, and you, you've got to go over here and do that. I'm quitting. I can't read those books. I never read a book in my life in high school, and that big thick book, and another one on top of it, and another book. No, what's the use of me to start? I can't do it. I can't read those books. So what's the use to start? I'm going to go over to Paris Island in South Carolina and join the Marines. And I packed up my books and I packed up everything and I was going to go the next morning and go over to Paris Island that's in South Carolina and join the Marines. And I went up on the campus. It's it's September in South Carolina, it's warm. I went up on campus and I sat down on a bench. I didn't know anybody. I sat down on a bench and I was waiting till the next morning to leave. I packed. And I'm in front of the building, classrooms, one floor, two floors, three floors. Up there on the third floor, there was a piano. There's no school at night. The boy up there just fooled around. And he sat down and he's playing. A boy up there playing piano with the windows open because it's hot. And I hear him playing. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and to, to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. I've heard. I got off that bench and got down on my knees and put my elbows on the bench. I said, Lord, if you'll be my friend and help me, I'll go as far as I can. I know I can't make it, but I will go as far as I can. I will start and go as far as I can. So I went to class. Four years later, I walked out of there and never failed a course. And I had to take a foreign language. I passed it by the grace of God. I had to take mathematics and they put me in algebra. I didn't even know how to spell it. And I made it. I didn't quit. I didn't quit. Down through the times, I could tell you times that you wanted to quit. I never quit. Quit wasn't in me. My mother was a tough Irish woman, full of tenacity. She would fight any problem. She would fight any problem. And I had that in me. And I would, I would never quit. I'd fight, but I wouldn't quit. I won't quit. I'm here 72 years later. I never quit. I never, Paul, this isn't, this isn't strange. Paul is pressed in spirit. He's depressed. He's discouraged. He's ready to quit and, te and was pressed in spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. 
Next. Next word. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your heads. I am clean. From the henceforth I'll go unto the Gentiles. See what I told you he did in every town? He went to the synagogue. He taught for a while. Then they got mad at him. They either went after him or he walked out and went to a separate. He went to the house next door. There was a synagogue. He fell out with them. They're going to go after him. He goes over to the next door to a house of Jason. And the church meets next door to where he had the problem. Your blood be upon your heads. I'm leaving you Jews. You'll answer in judgment. Your blood will be upon you. I am clean. I am clean. When Paul walked out of Ephesus, he said, the blood of no man's hands is on me. He hadn't witnessed everybody, but he had seen that everybody in town had been witnessed to by the Christians. I am clean. Henceforth I go. I go unto the Gentiles. There he goes. Does the same thing everywhere. Leaves the Jews, goes to the Gentiles. He did it in Athens at the marketplace. He did it in Ephesus. He did it there. He did it in Antioch of Presidia. He did it on Iconium. He did it in Lystria. And he did it in Derby. He fought with the Jews, taught them, and fought with them, and then went on to the Gentiles. Uh, next. He departed from the Jews and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God. He's a God worshiper whose house joined hard to the synagogue, joined hard to the synagogue, side by side, joined hard. Justice, where the early church at Corinth met, was next door to the synagogue. Okay? Okay. Next. Next, Crispus. He's the chief ruler of the synagogue. Believed. The main man in the synagogue where he taught, most of them rejected Paul. He got saved. He believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. I said, after he left, the Jews, always Gentiles, got saved. People got saved. The Corinthians, that's Gentiles, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So, people getting saved. But Paul is depressed. Next. Then the Lord knows he's depressed. Then the Lord, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. In Paul's lifetime, he had three visions. He had one at Troas, and he had one at Corinth. And then when he was in trouble in Jerusalem and they were going to kill him, God gave him a vision there. He had three. That's all, three. Be not afraid, God says to Paul. Don't be afraid. He went there in fear and trembling. Don't be afraid. Speak. Don't be afraid. Speak. You go somewhere after you're here and to start a church. Don't be afraid. Speak. Preach. Preach in the marketplace. Preach anywhere. Don't be afraid. Speak. Hold not thy peace. Next. For I am with thee. Boy, that's a good message for a depressed man. I am with thee. For somebody ready to quit, I am with thee. I am with thee. When I was ready to quit and go join the Marines, that boy played, what a friend we had in Jesus, and those words in Sunday school came back to me that Jesus was my friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. You're not going to get hurt. Don't leave, Paul. I have many people in this city to be saved. I have many people. And you get the, you start a church and 
the first Sunday or two, you got your wife and nobody else, and then she got a neighbor woman to come. You got three. Don't quit. God's got many people in that city. Many people. Many. For I have much people in this city. Next. He continued there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. What all did he teach? Oh, just read 1 Corinthians. What trouble they had. Those people were wild people. They were immoral people when they got saved. They're a tough bunch to get in line for the Lord. They're tough. They got into divisions, and they said, I follow Jesus, I follow Peter, I follow Christmas, I follow Apollos. They all divided up into different groups. Then uh, they got in problem over leadership in the church. They got in problem with immorality in the church. They got in problem about marriage and separation and divorce. They got in trouble with Christian liberty. Then came the problem of dispute about the Lord's table. Then the gifts of the Spirit, the speaking in tongues and all the gifts, and everybody wanted the best one, and everybody wanted, and they're carnal, they're people that came out of sin. They're not very spiritual. They want to put on shows and do everything and uh, finally ends up with a problem about the resurrection and then ends up the last chapter in giving money, b b giving and receiving. He taught the Word of God among them. Then he wrote a letter about the problems they were having. All right, he taught the Word of God among them next. And, and uh, Gallo, Gallo, Galileo, Galileo. He is the same as Pontius Pilate was in Israel. He is the governor, the proconsul, they called him. He is the governor. He was the deputy of Achaia. And he is a brother to the greatest philosopher in Rome. He is a brother to Seneca, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. Those were all great Athenian philosophers. But Rome, they had one. And his name was Seneca, like the lake we go to up there for our picnic every year. Seneca Lake. That name goes back through, clear back to this man who's the philosopher in Rome. Gallo was a brother to him. He had, they had a great influence. The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul. The Jews went to the governor like the Jews did with Pilate when Jesus was on earth and going to die. The Jews went to Pilate and said, you've got to put him to death. They went here. The Jews go to Gallo, who is a Roman Greek Gentile governor of Corinth, <laughs> of Achaia, the area, the province, and brought him to the judgment seat. Brought Paul to the judgment seat. You walk down the main street of Corinth, there's a wall. You stop. There's a word in Greek, bima, bima, judgment seat. The judge sat up there, and men would come, and if they had a dispute over a cow, they'd go to the judge sitting up there, the bima, the bima. That's the same word used for the judgment seat of Christ where we will all go. We will all go to the Bema. We won't go to the white throne judgment. Unsaved people go to the white throne judgment. We go to the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. That's where it came from, Bema, there in Corinth. And Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, the Bema, next saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. He's not lined up with the Old Testament. He's not lined up with Moses. He's got something about this man Jesus that you can believe upon him and be saved, and you can uh, serve him, and you can live with him forever. He's talking about something that's not in our law. Yeah. 
Next. When Paul was now about to open his mouth, the governor spoke. Galileo and said to the Jews, if this were a matter of wrong, wrong or wicked lewdness, you Jews, reason with <coughs> If this, <coughs> if this man had broken the law, done something immoral, wicked, I'd listen to you. I don't have anything to do with what you're talking about, your law. <coughs> you Jews' law. I'm not in on that. I'm a Gentile ruler. Next. <coughs> but if it be a question of words and names and your law, Look you to it. You take care of it. I'll be no judge of this matter, of what I'm going to do with this man because he did something contrary to your law. That's your law. You deal with it. It's over with me. I went free. God said he wouldn't be hurt. Next. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Galileo drove them away, the Jews. Next. And all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio, he cared nothing about it. Some reason they beat up on Sosthenes and Galileo, I don't care. He liked Pilate. I want to wash my hands of this. Uh, I'm just the governor here. I don't want in on your trouble. Next. Next. Paul, after this, tarried there a good while, a year and a half, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence to Syria and with Priscilla and Aquila with him. That couple he lived with and made tents with and led them to the Lord. They're leaving with him. And Paul had made a vow somewhere. The Bible doesn't tell us what vow he made. Maybe he made it in Antioch of Persidia, or maybe he made it in Iconium or Syria or Antioch of Syria. He made a vow to the Lord about something. But anyway, he made a vow that during that vow, he'd never cut his hair. Evidently, the vow, whatever it was, is over, and Paul got a haircut. He shorn his head, in a chief, for he had a vow. He, sure, he cut his hair because the vow's over. He let his hair grow all the time the vow was on. Now it's over. He gets a haircut. He shows his head. Okay. Now we leave him. And Paul's going up the road with Aquila and Priscilla. Got somebody with him. And they're going to Ephesus. He'll stay there three years. That's next study. I didn't think we'd get through Corinth, but we got through Corinth, got Paul out of town. A lot of good things in there. A lot of good things in there about being a missionary. You don't quit. Don't quit. Don't ever think about quit. Take quit out of your vocabulary. Don't ever think of quitting. Well, what about when you're when you're seven, been at 72 and you're 90 years old and you can't talk without coughing, I'm not going to quit. As long as I can go, I'm not going to quit. The only time I'll quit is when the Lord quits me. If the Lord quits me, I'm done. But I'm still going. And I'm not going to quit. I'll be here tomorrow. Okay. Some of you frown. <laughs> okay, that's it. You're dismissed. Got about 10 minutes now.